Hello interwebs and happy International Transgender Day of Visibility. Look at me, being all visible. Light waves bounce off of me pretty well. Anyways, <laughs> now that I've done the nerd humor, seriously, today, March 31st, is Transgender Day of Visibility, a day where we celebrate the transgender community and also talk about the discrimination faced by trans people worldwide. And in honor of that, uh, in a few moments, I'm going to scream like a weirdo at the top of my lungs off of this here balcony. And I really hope someone yells back at me, <laughs> someone out there is going to scream back at me, but who knows. But before I do that, I want to talk briefly about why I'm going to do that. You know, besides the fact that I'm a huge weirdo and proud of it, and also the fact that I'm trans. But being weird and being trans are two separate things, by the way. But I am both. But jokes aside, I do want to talk about why I'm going to scream off this balcony, because I want to talk briefly about what visibility means for trans people and for me specifically. As I've talked about numerous times on this channel before, when I was growing up, I knew that something didn't fit with me. Uh, I didn't know what it was at the time, but what I know now is that it was my gender. My gender didn't seem to fit, but I didn't really have the words to express that when I was a kid. I just felt off. Off about the way I was told to be and exist in the world. It's like, um, it's like a bug bite that just itches and scratches, but I didn't know, like I said, I didn't know how to express that. I didn't know what that meant or how to feel about it. But I did keep feeling it. I never could stop feeling it. And as I got older, that feeling, that, that itch just kept growing and growing because the expectations of who I was supposed to be kept getting bigger. Be tough, don't cry, wear these types of clothing. But things, as that happened, the itch just kept getting worse. It kept getting painful, actually. And all I could do was think about it all day, every day. And so I kept scratching at it, trying to satisfy it, kept trying to double down on who I was supposed to be, but I never could stop it, ever. It was always there. And then one day, I found a way that actually worked to scratch that itch. It was a little bit of a weird thing, but I wore some of my mother's clothes when she wasn't home, when she was out for a day. I just did it to explore. And for a moment, it didn't stop the feeling, but it helped. It made me feel better for a moment, just wearing my mother's dress. But I didn't know what that meant. I just knew that I wasn't supposed to be doing that. I had been told never to do something like that, never wear female clothes. But it made me feel good. It made me feel okay. I had this conflicting feeling in my brain that I was doing something gross and weird and strange. But my body and my feelings were telling me that this was just a moment where I could just exist without constantly needing to think about this damn feeling that I was feeling all the time. But boys weren't supposed to do this. And I had never seen anyone show me that exploring this side of myself was okay. And so despite how good it made me feel, or at least how calm it made me feel, I hid it. I stole small pieces of my mother's clothing and hid them under my bed to wear whenever I was alone, whenever, you know, my parents would go out, just to get a small respite. But it was always when I was alone. And when I was alone, I would just play video games or read a book or something like that while wearing a dress or a bra or something like that, just normal everyday stuff. But just getting to exist wearing my mother's clothes, I just felt more comfortable. I felt like I could just exist without having to constantly feel that in my brain. What I know now are though that those moments in my room alone despite them being dull moments of everyday life that I just happened to be wearing women's clothing in, those moments were the most me moments that I had as a kid. Everything else, to some degree or another, was just a facade that I put up. Yes, bits of me shone through. I mean, I was a Trekkie in school and a nerd and a geek and all that stuff, but it was always through this filter, this filter of a performance. Everything else, the real me, was hidden from view behind that veneer. And at that time, I didn't know that being transgender existed. I didn't have the words to know how to begin to explore that because I'd never seen or heard what that meant or even had a concept of it. 
It's very hard to express something you've never seen before or have words to understand it with. The words that I did eventually find to express myself were through science fiction. You know, Star Trek and aliens who got to change and play with gender, like Dead Sea Dax in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. That's how I was able to express myself, through the form of an alien, something not even human. But that alien felt more like me than anything human in real life that I had ever discovered. So it's no wonder then that I still relate to this day to Star Trek so much, because it was the first time that I got to see myself. And there's an element in me, element of me that's so glad that I found Star Trek that way, because Star Trek gave me more than just seeing myself through alien metaphor. It gave me a sense of morality, a sense of belief in the betterment of the world. There's so much about Star Trek that I, I grew to, but it all kind of started there with being able to see myself. But it meant that I saw myself in a fictional character first. In not only a fictional character, but a fictional character that was alien, different, weird, strange, not of this world. Not as something that is real, that could exist in the world. The real me, in real life, was hidden behind a closed door, only shown when I was alone, and the only people who understood me, who saw me, who seemed like me, were people who didn't even really exist. And so that began to make me wonder, if no one saw the real me, and the only versions of that real me that I saw were fictional, do I really exist too? Was that real me real? Do these feelings that I feel, do they even matter? Do I matter? Those are the kinds of questions that you ask yourself if you never get to see others like yourself. Real people expressing the real feelings you have. You begin to question your own existence, your own meaning. You begin to think of yourself as fictional. And the fictional version of yourself that you present to other people, well, that doesn't feel real either because it's not. And so, in every aspect of your life, you just become invisible. And if you're invisible, and if you're not seen, and no one can see you, it's like you don't exist. And if you don't exist, then what's the point of attempting to exist at all? Why keep trying? And once you hit that line of thought, suicidal thoughts, they become a constant companion. Not a day went by for years of my life where those thoughts didn't enter my brain. Thankfully, I didn't follow through on any of that, obviously, but well, let's just say that wasn't always a sure thing. You see, to be visible requires two things. It's not enough to just exist. To be visible requires you to exist, and it requires someone else to see you. Being visible is a relationship. It's a form of communication. It requires someone else to want to communicate with you, to want to see you. And for a long time, I felt that no one would, that no one would want to see me, because no one saw me for a very, very long time. And it's no wonder the most depressed I ever got was the closest I ever came to actually killing myself. And that it happened right before I came out to my best friend. Because those were the options. Be seen, finally be seen, or never be seen again. And so when I finally told my friend, when he finally saw me, when I came out to him, he acknowledged me, he hugged me, he let me cry for a minute, and then a few minutes later we just talked about video games because being trans is only part of me. It's only a part of the larger whole. I'm a giant nerd and all that stuff. But if you miss that part of me, the trans part of me, you're not seeing the real me. The real me is a trans woman who likes to talk about nerdy crap. But the real conversation my friend and I had in that moment wasn't about video games. It was a conversation between two people looking at each other who actually saw each other fully for the first time. And today, today the thing I hid the most from others is now the thing that I wear upon my sleeve. You know, I'm standing on a balcony talking about being trans. I'm pretty sure people down there on the sidewalk can hear me talking about it and you're listening to me and talking about it right now.
I will let you know that I'm trans and I will never hide it because it makes me feel real. It makes me feel like me. But I needed to be seen first. And I was lucky that I got to be seen. You know, I mean, I mean to say I was lucky, but I mean, lucky is a relative term. I had to face a society telling me that trans was be weird or bad. I had to face a religious family who had an upbringing that grew to think that being any form of LGBTQ was at the very least a morally wrong thing that we could put up with. You know, they had an inability to see trans people as good. So, I guess lucky <laughs> is the wrong word, but I did have a friend who would see me. I lived in the part of the United States that was, at least at that time, starting to become more accepting and aware of LGBTQ issues. And eventually my family loved me more than some random lines in a very old book that meant a lot to them. Even if it took them, took some of them I should say, some time to express that or figure that out or figure out what that meant for them. So in that way, I was lucky that there were those who communicated with me by seeing the real me. But sometimes that conversation of visibility isn't so positive for myself and for every trans person. We live in a world where transgender visibility has been met with laws and legislation that harm transgender people. Look at the recent horrible bill that passed just this week in Arkansas that limits transgender people's access to health care. Or the numerous anti-transgender laws about transgender people in sports around the United States right now, or in other countries as well, like the United Kingdom. Or the stigmatization of being trans just in general throughout the world, or even worse, the vilification and outright violence towards transgender people. Specifically, transgender people of color, most of all. That's sadly sometimes the conversation being had when transgender people get seen. But that conversation isn't really a conversation. It's a lecture, a lecture at us, because it's talking to trans people to try and tell us how to be, how to behave, how to be seen, forcing us to be fictional characters. Because you see, there are trans people who still don't get to be seen in this world. In a world where transgender people are more visible than ever, this discrimination, this forcing of transgender people to not be who we really are, to hide ourselves, makes transgender people feel like maybe they should just keep the real them hidden. Hidden because maybe their family won't accept them or the world won't accept them. And so they hide behind that closed door, wondering if they actually exist because no one will see the real them. And they wonder if they're really there. And they think maybe they don't. That they're invisible. That they don't exist and that maybe they shouldn't even try. Because they're not able to communicate. They're cut off from anyone who wants to talk to them, to see them. And so we need to change the conversation. We need to change it by constantly forcing ourselves as trans people to be seen as our true selves, the ones who are privileged enough to be able to do that. We are not fictional characters. We are not what someone wants us to be seen as. We are seen as ourselves. We are ourselves. You need to see us as who we truly are, fully and completely, in order to actually talk to us, to have a conversation with us. Because the real us is really awesome. Like, really awesome, y'all. I mean, cool may be the wrong word, but I think I'm a pretty cool person. I'm not perfect. I'm a giant dork. But I think I'm a good person that I add to the world that I bring a little bit more joy and kindness and love to the people in my life and the things that I'm able to affect and touch. At least I try to. I'm just happy that I get the chance to add to the goodness of the world. But I'm only able to do that because someone saw me, because you see me. And I'm so glad you do. And there are so many trans people who probably still add to the goodness of the world, but could add so much more if we just allowed them to be seen, allowed them to share who they are. Probably much more than I can. I'm just a dork making videos. Being visible means being able to have a conversation with someone. And for so many, it's like they don't have the chance to talk. They don't get to. But I want to hear them so badly because what they have to say, I'm betting, is pretty damn cool. And so for all of those who feel that 
they aren't being seen. I just want you to know that you are. I may not literally be able to see you with my own two eyes right now, but that doesn't make you any less visible to me. We are having a conversation right now. It may not be the best way, it may be alone in your room if you're watching this, but it is something, and I do see you. Not everyone may get to see the real you right now, but I do, and so do many others in the transgender community. We all see you. And I think I speak for all of us when I say in this conversation that we love you. We love what we see. And so, for all of you who may not be able to do this for yourself, I'm going to do something for you, for the world. Hey world! I'm transgender and that's fucking awesome! And so are you. Live long and prosper. <laughs> Patrons, it is time to assemble! Catherine Lambeth, Miranda Janelle, Ashley Allen, Bokikio, Eli Berg Moss, Ashlyn Solstice, John Cool, Greg Gillum, Stephen Kleinard, Chamomile T, Randy Thompson, Wellington Marcus, Boyd Earl, and Mary Beth Earl, Stephen Schuhart, Wayne Twitchell, Auntie Kate, 808, Rick Osborne, Dominic Noble, Ish the Mad, Buttoneer, John Steele, Meadow Whisperer, Gavin Robinson, Michael Beam, ah! Munir Amlani, BBD, Jason Knott, Hannah F, Andrew K, Bree Beecher, Jasmine, Sky Skinner, Maeve, Skyler Gray, Flynn Nathan Steele, Tiffany Danger, Sean Piper, Geek Filter, Jane Packard, Wen Dizzle Bizzle. <laughs> Why? Why? Why do I do this to myself? Sarah Bystem, James Karate, Jacob Tovar, W. Randy Edie, Mari Neckar, Bush, Celestial Dawn, Din, Mark the Edge, Pissed and Twisted Garage, Lily, Polly Mina, Laura Demo, Lisa, Nikki, Gordon, Bloomfield, Andrew, Lama Rose, Zone One Librarian, Jenny Mabel, Michael Hardy, and finally, Corey Honkinen and Vale Dunn. All right, not my best patron rap, but I figured it would still be fun for you to see all my failure on screen immortalized in every video this month. Also, I know I mixed Captain America and Superwoman. Deal with it. But thank you, honestly, to all my patrons. I really appreciate all of you, and you really mean a lot to me. Um, I would not be able to do this without you. Thank you so much for supporting me being an absolute dork and weirdo. I wish you all the best.